In this video, I'm going to compare the dynamic range between the Canon T2i, which is also known as the 550D, and the Nikon 5100. A lot of you may have read online how the latest Nikon cameras have higher dynamic range than the Canon bodies, but perhaps you're not quite sure what exactly this means or how it can really help your photography. So before I show you some comparison photos between the cameras, I'm going to take a few minutes to discuss what dynamic range actually is and how it's measured. And then we'll dive right into the photograph so you can see how dynamic range works in practice. So what is dynamic range? Well, the technical definition is it's the range of stops that a camera can render in a scene from the very darkest of shadows to the lightest of highlights, and for which there's an acceptable amount of detail and noise for each of those extremes. Now, a light stop is just another way of saying a doubling or halving of light. So if a scene has 14 stops of dynamic range, that's saying that the scene has 14 levels or doubling of light values from the very darkest of shadows to the highlight. Now here's an example of a photograph that shows both deep shadows as well as bright highlights. The extremes of those, the darkest of the shadows and the lightest of highlights, represents the dynamic range of the scene, which is also called the contrast of the scene. What signifies acceptable noise can vary. There's an objective measure of acceptable noise, and that's what DxO uses on their website when they rate the dynamic range of all the cameras that they test. For their objective value, they're measuring the signal-to-noise ratio. When the noise starts to overwhelm the amount of detail or signal in the deepest of shadows, that's the bottom range of what the dynamic range is for that particular camera. Most photographers measure as acceptable is a lot more subjective, and it can depend either on the photographer and also on the particular photograph. Because between two different scenes, even though both may have the same amount of noise, in one scene the noise may be much more visible than another scene based upon the content of the scene and how well the noise is hidden. And so it's really subjective as to what's acceptable on a given photograph. And then also, even if there is levels of noise that aren't acceptable, you can counteract that noise by applying luminance noise reduction, which actually blurs the noise to blend it into the detail of the photograph. The expense of doing that, though, is losing some detail and color. And so that also is subjective as to how much noise reduction you can apply to a photograph while still producing an acceptably detailed result. Well, there's two determining factors which really establish what the dynamic range of a given camera and that camera's sensor is. At the high end of that range, at the brightest highlight area, the dynamic range is determined by how many photons the sensor can capture before reaching what's called the saturation or clipping point, which is also called the full well capacity. When the sensor captures an image, it's filling up its wells, they're called, for each of the pixels, and there's a, a fixed limit as to how many of those photons each pixel can hold. And once you've reached that fullness point, that's the saturation point where any more photons that fall upon that pixel get lost. And so the deeper that well, or the more photons it can capture, the deeper range of highlights you can capture, which extends the amount of dynamic range on the, on the upper end of the range within the highlights. Traditionally, full-frame cameras have had deeper full well capacities than crop cameras, but that's not always the case. In more contemporary designs, a lot of these crop cameras have equal full well capacities relative to some of the full-frame cameras. At the lower end of that tonal range, again, tonal range between the shadows and the highlights, you have the shadows, and for the shadows, the dynamic range is really established by how much noise the camera's electronics adds to the captured image, and this is what's called read noise. This is noise that the camera introduces into the image that's not already there. That's noise that's induced by the camera, and it happens to be that that noise is constant across the entire tonal range of the image, and so there's the same amount of noise introduced within the deep shadows as there is being introduced into the highlights. Even though that noise exists both in the shadows and the midtones and the highlights, the noise only starts becoming perceptible as you go further and further into the shadows because the amount of light in the shadows is going down, but the read noise is constant. The read noise represents an increasing percentage of the image data. At the very extreme of the deepest shadow, you get to the point where the read noise completely overwhelms the signal, and it actually represents um, the majority of the data. And it's at that point that establishes the bottom range, the dynamic range that that camera is capable of. Of those two factors between the shadow noise and the full well capacity, it's the shadow noise that has the biggest differentiator in modern sensor designs. Now, and this is where Sony's sensors lead the pack. They really started their lead with their 12 megapixel sensor, which was used in the Nikon D90 and D5000, as well as the Pentax KX. 
and they further increased that lead with their latest 16 megapixel sensor, which is used in the D7000 and the D5100, as well as in the Pentax K5. Aside from having a lower amount of absolute shadow noise, another major advantage the Sony sensor has is that its noise, the little that it does have, is completely free of cross-hatch banding, which is seen on other designs, particularly the Canon sensors. And I'll show examples of that when I start comparing the photographs. But it basically looks like somebody scribbled in horizontal and vertical lines across the image a repeating pattern. And it becomes very obvious to the user, unlike the normal noise profile, which is very random and sometimes sort of blends into the total content of the image and doesn't stand out as much. It also happens to be very difficult to remove in photo editing tools. It pretty much survives most of the types of noise reduction you attempt to use to get rid of it. And it particularly survives downsampling of the image where you're actually lowering the resolution to print to a, a given form factor. For instance, an 8x10 print, the banding actually becomes more obvious in, in those cases because the downsampling reduces the normal random noise, but it doesn't really reduce the banding noise. And so on a relative basis, the banding noise becomes much more apparent for the overall content of the image. To utilize this dynamic range in practice, since most of the dynamic range is established on a low end in the shadows, you really need to push those shadows in post-processing after you've taken the photograph. So at the upper end, you have the highlights, and so you normally expose it so that the highlights are not clipped. And to do that, though, requires you to underexpose the shadows. And you need to then correct that underexposure by elevating those shadows in post uh, after the fact. There are two types of dynamic range. There's the input dynamic range, which is what the camera provides and what is in the original scene. And then there's the output dynamic range, which is the dynamic range of what your output device is capable of displaying, for instance, your monitor or your printed output. And so it normally is such that the original scene dynamic range is much higher than what a camera can produce. And then in turn, the, what the dynamic range a camera can produce is also much higher than what a typical output device can produce. When cameras capture a high dynamic range scene, if you want to be able to render that on an output device, you need to compress those ranges of stop lights into a fewer number of stops so that all of those stops can be represented in the image. And that process is called tone mapping. It's really the same process used in HDR photography where you take multiple photographs with varying exposures and then you blend those exposures together in a single photograph. So the process of pushing the shadows for a single exposure, a single photograph, is really identical to an HDR. The difference is rather than using multiple photographs with different exposure, you're really pushing and pulling a single photograph to sort of replicate what those different exposures are. So a side effect of pushing the shadow is that it makes the noise more visible. There's noise in all parts of the image, but again, the noise is much more obvious within the shadow region because there's less image data there relative to the noise. And uh, progressively, the noise becomes more visible as you push down into the shadows. And so to lift those shadows up or to make them brighter also brightens the noise that's within those shadows. Some of that noise can be offset with luminous noise reduction, but again, at the expense of detail. What are the limitations of pushing the shadows as a means to achieve dynamic range? Well, to understand that, you first need to understand tonality and the potential for posterization. Camera sensors are linear devices, and they convert analog photon data, or light, into digital values, and that process is called quantization. Each stop of light within the sensor's dynamic range is assigned a fixed number of unique values each of which represents different brightness levels within that stop. We've talked about how one stop to the next represents a doubling or halving of light, but within that stop, you also need to represent the different levels of light, and that is called the tonality. Tonality refers to how many unique values you can represent within that light. Uh, the greater the tonality, the greater the representation of fine gradations in the brightness values within that stop. And so because sensors are linear devices, in this case we're going to really talk about 14-bit sensors, the brightest stop of light, meaning the stop starting at the clipping point down by one full stop, is represented by a total of 8,192 unique values. And so all the luminance values within that one stop of light are discreetly represented in 8,192 unique steps. The next stop of light, which is the, the next less bright, is represented only by 4,096 levels of values. And then it progressively goes down by half until you eventually get down to the very deepest of shadows where only maybe 16, 8, 4, all the way down to one discrete value are used to represent the unique brightness values in light. And so there's much less resolution to represent that tonality within the shadows as there is within the highlights.
if the number of gradations of light, meaning the light in the original scene has different gradations, for instance, if you look at a sky and it sort of looks like it transitions from a deep blue to a lighter blue, now if the number of those gradations exceeds the available unique values to represent it, then that's when posterization can occur. And again, that's much more likely within the deeper shadows because there's fewer unique values that are available to represent those gradations. To demonstrate that, I have this chart here. And so what you see up top is a representation, a rough representation of the different stops of light that the camera quantitizes. And so for the brightest stop, you have a real precise level of gradations that can be represented within the image data. And it's very unlikely that you would see any posterization uh, within that brightest stop. And then the likelihood progressively increases as you go further down the tonal scale. What you see at the bottom is an example of what posterization looks like. On the left, you see a completely gradated wedge of gray starting from the deep black to bright white. And then on the right is what I've represented what that looks like if you only have eight unique values to represent that total range of gradation. What you can see happens is basically the original tonality gets averaged into these large blocks. And so you have, instead of the fine gradations of black on the left, you have pure black, and then you go right into a dark gray, then a slightly lighter gray, all the way up to the point where you get to bright white. And so you've gone from on the left, which is 256 unique values of gray, compressed down to just eight values of gray. Now, another limitation of achieving dynamic range with shadow pushing is color fidelity. The way these sensors are designed is that they actually capture color in three separate channels, the red, green, and blue channel. Each of those channels has a different spectral sensitivity to its color, and so there's different levels of noise between the channels. Now, normally when you're looking at the mid-tones and the highlights, that difference of sensitivity doesn't matter because the image data is bright enough to completely overwhelm the noise. But as you go into the deeper shadows, that noise becomes much more important, and the color reproduction is affected adversely because of it. And so if you have a lot of noise, for instance, in the red and blue channel, which is typically the case compared to the green channel, the raw processor like Lightroom may not be able to accurately reproduce those colors from the raw data because, again, there's too much noise in one of the channels relative to the other. And so what should be maybe a yellow color now is going to look maybe more greenish because there's more noise in one channel versus another. And this becomes critical at the very deepest of the shadows. So what this actually shows up as is color blotchiness, and I'll demonstrate what that looks like when I compare the photographs. Now there's alternatives to relying on extended dynamic range of sensors, and these are traditional photography techniques. The first is fill flash, and that's when you use a flash to balance the light levels within the scene. What you're really doing is elevating the light levels of the shadows so that they're not as far away from the, the light levels within the highlights. Flash isn't always possible, and one of the obvious cases where it's not possible is when the subject that you have is out of range of the flash. Other cases when the flash is not advisable is when it may create unacceptable reflections. Now, another alternative to dynamic range is HDR, which I've already discussed. And again, that's where you use multiple exposures of the same photograph, and you change the exposures from one photograph to the next. The idea of blending those exposures together so that one photograph is, ex is exposed for the shadows, and then another photograph exposes the highlights, and then you combine those exposures together and get a very clean final image. The, ideally, HDR requires a tripod for best results, because since you're shooting multiple photographs, if you move the camera from uh, one exposure to the next, they're not going to align. Now, a lot of HDR software can adjust for that, but it's still much better to use a tripod. Another more limiting example is when there's any motion or action within the scene. So again, since shooting multiple photographs of the same scene with the intention of blending them together, well, if you have any subject area within that scene that's moving, then it's going to be in one position on one of those exposures and another position in a, in a different. And so then it becomes extremely difficult to try to blend those two photographs together to create one coherent photo which shows that subject in the same area, it really becomes almost impossible to match up those exposures identically.